Combining fundamental and technical analysis to trade the stock market, Chris Vecchio from Daily FX. Chris, it is all you. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you may be. Thanks so much for coming and joining this presentation today. My name is Christopher Vecchio. I'm the senior strategist here at Daily FX. I'm also a chartered financial analyst, CFA charter holder um, as of 2017. Uh, I've been trading in markets for, oh, over a decade, 15 years plus now at this point. And I've traded a several number of products. I've traded short-term options contracts. I've traded leaps. I've traded FX, little spot and futures. Uh, I also do a significant amount of investing in my uh, spare time. So I have a little bit of experience um, in all different corners of the markets. Of course, today we are talking about combining fundamental and technical analysis to trading the stock market. And I want to remind everyone in trading, there is more than one way to skin a cat. You can have a purely fundamental view. You can have a purely technical view. You can have a purely quantitative view. But I find that the most success that I've had over the course of my trading career has come when I've combined these approaches. I picked and choose different approaches within each subset of analysis uh, to get a holistic point of view in the market. And uh, some other people may issue this. They may say, no, I'm a purely technical person. I'm a purely fundamental. But I think that if you take different tools from each analytical skill set, and you combine them, you can get the most well-rounded view of what's happening in the market at any given one point in time. So with that said, we are going to jump into things here. Of course, I do have just some quick risk disclaimers here to show across the screen. Please be aware that any opinion I disseminate is mine and mine alone, does not constitute trade advice on behalf of Daily FX, IG, IG Group, or Nadex. If you do have any comments or questions, you can always ask them in the chat box at any point in time. Uh, if you want to stay in touch after the session, you can always do so with me at the Daily FX Real Time Newsfeed on Stock Twitch or on Twitter at C Vecchio FX. That's C V E C C H I O F X. All right. With that said, let's start with the basics. Let's start with the fundamentals here uh, because the fundamentals, I think, are the bedrock of your analysis, right? Let's just say, for example, I want to go from New York to Los Angeles. I know that I need to head from east into west. That is the fundamental discussion that we're going to be having today, heading from east to west. The technicals, mind you, those are more of the specific timing instructions, which highways I'm turning off on, how fast I'm going, where I need to stop and get gas, or perhaps stay the night to get some rest. When you combine these things, you simply just can't head from east to west, right? You need to know where you need to turn off, where you need to uh, refuel. Uh, that's really why it's important. You know the direction you're heading, but also when you need to accelerate or decelerate within that broader trend direction. But the fundamentals here, are really six points that I wanna discuss when we're talking about the broader stock market uh, and even individual companies within the stock market, right? Um, of course, the financial health of the company in the market is first and foremost. Have we seen, you know, for example, revenues and profits increasing in recent years? Are earnings going up or down? Uh, do we see that the market has a high level of debt or margin debt, people borrowing to trade? All these things are very important in terms of understanding whether or not the market is in a healthy or unhealthy place. Uh, I know some of the charts that have been going around recently, particularly if you find yourself in social media corners, like on Twitter or stock twits, twits or uh, even in you know Reddit's Wall Street Bets Forum, for which I've been a, a member for a number of years, uh, you'll see things like margin debt levels held by retail traders as a red flag that people have been waving for the past several weeks, curiously coinciding with this market sell-off. So we want to understand the financial health of the market. Uh, are things in a normal state? Are things in an overextended state? Have they become too frothy? These are questions that you need to ask yourself. So um, we also want to talk about innovation levels, right? We want to talk about whether or not a company or the companies that are coming into the market are bringing new technologies and new products. So often is the case when we go through periods uh, of economic contraction, of uh, monetary policy tightening, of fiscal stimulus withdrawal, we tend to see that less risks are taken. Companies aren't provided the startup capital that they need, access to the credit that they need in order to take those moonshots, to develop those new type of things. It's only once we see a shift in economic conditions uh, uh, when we see that the market is moving back towards expansion, that growth companies are provided the capital that they're required in order to take those kind of risks that ultimately lead to 
outperforming stocks and therefore a stronger overall market. Uh, I do want to bring up a chart from point one here talking about the financial health of the market, and that's the S&P 500 earnings yield. Uh, thankfully, the S&P 500 has been trading for a number of decades, in fact, over a century. So we have a long shelf life of historical data here that we can measure um, whether or not the market's in a healthy place or not. The earnings yield for the S&P 500 is the trailing 12-month earnings of the broader index divided by the price of the index. Typically, when earnings yields are higher, it's deemed to be a better time to buy. When earnings yields are lower, it's deemed a worse time to buy. Why? Because there's a concept out there known as the Fed ratio where you compare the earnings yield of the S&P 500 to U.S. Treasury yields. The fact of the matter is that stocks are riskier than bonds and treasuries are deemed to be the safest security that you can get your hands on in the market. The default of a U.S. government or the risk of a U.S. government default, excuse me, is extremely low. And therefore, if you invest in U.S. Treasury yields, you are near guaranteed to get your money back. And so when you take a look at the profile of stocks versus bonds, if you can get a similar return on your bonds relative to stocks, why take all that additional risk? Why not take the guaranteed cash flows, the guaranteed yield payments, the coupons, uh, uh, as opposed to being concerned about whether or not some CEO uh, or some CFO uh, participates in some corporate malfeasance that may upend your individual security selection. So generally speaking, when the S&P 500 earnings yield is increasing, uh, when it's on its way up, when it is outstripping the U.S. Treasury 10-year yield, it's typically deemed to be a good time to buy stocks. And you know, we can see this over the past several decades, right? When the S&P 500's earning yield dipped in the late 2000s, we were going through a stock market crash. When we saw a big drop in the S&P 500's earnings yield at the start of 2020, we were going through the coronavirus pandemic crash. And for much of the past year and a half, almost two years now, the S&P 500 earnings yield has been rising, substantiating the fact that stock markets have been able to climb earnings profiles have been increasing even in the face of a higher price. And that generally speaking is a good thing. One of the reasons why, in my opinion, up until the last two or three weeks or so, we've seen a stock market, if it's the S&P, if it's the NASDAQ, if it's the Russell, climbing into those all-time highs. There are other factors to consider, of course. I did mention there were six points here that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk about dividends. Uh, dividends are really important to consider. You know, I know in this day and age, a lot of companies eschew dividends and instead prefer to do stock buybacks. And that a lot, a lot of that has to do with the tax considerations in play. It's cheaper and more capital effective uh, to go through and return capital to your shareholders vis-a-vis -vis a stock buyback, reducing the available float of stock on the market, thereby lifting the stock price, as opposed to paying out in dividends, which are taxed at a higher level capital gains are taxed at a lower rate than dividends. So if you can return capital to your shareholders, uh, why not do it through a stock buyback as opposed to dividends? But companies that do return capital via dividends are typically in a strong financial condition. When dividends in the broader market are increasing, it means that companies are making a lot of money and they have the ability to return capital to their shareholders. So that is a good sign. When a company or the broader market sees a decline in dividend payouts, it's typically a bad sign. The broader market companies that comprise the market, they need to hold on to more cash. They need to sock it away in a rainy day fund. Perhaps it means that they are worried about a potential lawsuit. Perhaps it means that there is some economic calamity ahead for the broader economy that they need to be concerned about. And so giving money back to their shareholders isn't necessarily the best course of action in the short term. And so you'll typically see headlines on days where companies announce earnings and boost their dividend payouts, it's seen as a sign of health for the broader market. When companies individually cut their dividend payouts, it's seen as a sign of concern for the broader market itself. And that's always an important headline to look out for whenever you're going through earnings season, which we are in the midst of right now. Of course, when it comes to earnings, we want to know whether or not a company is overvalued or undervalued. Typically, companies with low price to earnings ratios are considered fairly or undervalued. Companies with high price to earnings ratios are considered overvalued. 
Now, there are exceptions to this rule, of course. Companies like Tesla and Amazon over the years have had extraordinarily high price to earnings ratios. And in turn, that's pushed up the broader PE ratio of the entire market because people are not so concerned about what's happening in today and now, they're concerned about what's gonna happen in the future. A company like Amazon, investors really believed in their broader future goals of building out a massive distribution network uh, and services for consumers where they could, you know, instead of returning uh, earnings back to their shareholders, instead of generating that type of revenue um, and profit turnover, they were reinvesting in their operations, building out their supply chains. And so seeing the potential for a company to do that and take that kind of market share in the future, investors were more tolerant of a higher PE ratio. The same thing can be said for Tesla. Even though the earnings may have not been there in the short term, investors believed in the long-term vision of the company where one day those earnings would uh, come into the picture, would be generated to substantiate the high prices for the stock. But for the broader stock market itself, uh, generally speaking, a higher PE ratio has typically coincided with periods of tumult of concern that perhaps investors have gotten too far ahead of themselves. And when we see high PE ratios, we've tended to see the market correct soon thereafter. And we've seen this happen a number of times in recent decades. We saw this coming out of the 2000 stock bubble and then the ensuing recession that we had after 9-11. We saw an extraordinarily high PE ratio at the end of the 2000s, right around the global financial crisis. And we saw an extraordinarily high PE ratio that left stock markets vulnerable coming into the coronavirus pandemic. Curiously, and something that I think is a sign of broader health for the stock market itself, has been the fact that the PE ratio of the market has generally been falling since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. Yes, there was a correction in stocks in February and March 2020. But even in light of that correction, earnings have been going up as we looked at in the previous two slides with that earnings yield increasing, even in the face of higher prices. That's a good thing. The fact of the matter is that over the years, if you go back to 1870, and yes, that's 1870, we're talking about less than two decades after the Civil War, we can see that the PE ratio for the broader market has typically gyrated around 15. And in recent years, we've seen the PE ratio, perhaps due to the Fed's quantitative easing efforts, all of the risk taking that's been afoot in financial markets, these PE ratios have been typically hanging out around 20 or 25. So the fact of the matter is right now with the S&P 500's PE ratio back under 25, as of this morning, we're talking about a market that is not necessarily as overvalued as it once was, say, a year or two ago. And that is perhaps a good thing for the future. We also want to talk about two other conditions, liquidity in the markets, volatility in the markets. These are bedrock principles that everyone needs to understand. And I say that because liquidity is your ability to get in and out of a market. A highly liquid market is desirable. It means that you're able to go to the marketplace and basically get the price that you're looking for. Illiquid markets, like some single stocks, particularly you know pink sheets or over-the-counter stocks, may not have a lot of trading volume in them. It may be confined to a small select set of insiders who have deep private material non-public information about the market, and that leaves you at a disadvantage. So when you're trading markets, it would behoove you to stick to the ones that have deep liquid uh, uh, trading volumes. You're talking about individual stocks like your Apple, your Microsoft, or you're talking about the big US indices like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or the Russell, where there's a lot of activity, not just from speculators, but also from hedge funds and pension funds and other market makers uh, that are compensated ultimately for providing liquidity to these markets. We want liquidity because it means that when there are times of duress, there's an opportunity for someone to take the other side of our trade so we can get out of the market. Thin markets, illiquid markets, markets with low trading volume, while they may be appealing when stuff hits the fan, like we've seen in recent days, they tend to decline very, very quickly because there's quite frankly not a lot of other people willing to meet your price. Uh, finally, volatility here. Volatility refers to stocks with the highest potential for significant price movement. And for the broader market, we're talking about contracts or instruments like the VIX or VXN. 
Uh, VIX is a contract that looks at the 30-day implied volatility of the S&P 500. And as you may suggest or may understand, volatility tends to be bad. I say that because when you're talking about volatility, you're talking about uncertainty. And investors don't like uncertainty. We don't like uncertainty over dividends. We don't like uncertainty over cash flows or coupon payments or potential returns on our capital. We like certainty. People want to minimize their risk. And you as a speculator may say, well, I'm looking to take risk here in order to try to generate some alpha. And that's fair. But when you think about it from the broader market perspective, more volatility, while that may yield opportunity, means greater uncertainty. Uncertainty for how a company is going to perform, how a broader market is going to perform. And that's why when we take a look at the VIX versus the S&P 500, spikes in our blue line here, the VIX, tend to coincide with deeper market pullbacks. We saw this at the start of the coronavirus pandemic in February and March 2020. And in each subsequent pullback that we've had in the broader S&P 500 since the start of the pandemic, they've typically been correlated with spikes in volatility. We saw this in September 20. We saw this at the end of October 2020. We saw this back here in February 2021. More recently, when Omicron became a source of concern in early December 2021, and here today. In fact, the S&P 500 right now, falling to its lowest levels since the beginning of October, has coincided with the VIX rising to its highest level that we've seen since early 2021. Why might this be the case? Perhaps it's due to the Fed. Perhaps it's due to new COVID strains. Perhaps it's due to the fact that there could be war in Eastern Europe between Russia and Ukraine. For whatever reason you want to peg there, higher volatility has coincided with a steep decline over the last few weeks in U.S. equity prices. And that, in turn, has a very significant impact on our technical outlook. There are a few tools that I like to keep in my technical toolbox. I like to keep it simple. I really say when I keep it simple, I'm only using a handful of things on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're going to talk about those now. Those, we'll call them four things, would be Fibonacci retracements, moving averages, and then two sets of momentum indicators, MACD and slow stochastic. Now, I point to these four things because in part, it, it, it adheres to my trading style. Um, I am not someone who likes range trading. I'm not someone who necessarily even likes short-term scalping. I like trending markets. I like markets that have a significant chance to reverse. I like markets that have a significant chance to see fulfillment of momentum. And so the tools that I keep in my toolkit are generally speaking uh, geared towards breakout trading, geared towards trend trading. If you are not a trend trader, if you're not a breakout trader, if you are someone who likes to make their, uh, uh, you know, make their cheddar cheese uh, and sitting within a range and simply selling at resistance and buying at support, we may not see eye to eye in this next section. And that's fine. Like I said before, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to be successful in markets. But for me, I found the most success over the last few years. Perhaps it's because of my temperament, my psychological profile, uh, my worldview, that breakouts, momentum, trend trading, this is where I perform best. This is where I tend to do the best. And so here lies those four tools. Um, first, moving averages, of course. Moving averages, I think, are simple and effective because they give us a very clear indication for which way a market's been moving. When there's a wide spread between moving averages, it typically means that a market's trending. When moving averages are clustered together, it tends to mean that a market is range bound. You can use a number of different moving averages. When I'm operating in the market, I tend to use two different sets. Uh, one set would be the five, the eight, the 13, and the 21. I use those when I'm operating looking for entry points because I want to get a near term perspective on how prices have been moving within a month period. I use those particular numbers because those are Fibonacci numbers. The 21 day moving average, for example, is based on the fact that there are an average of 20.7 trading days in the average month over the course of the year. And if you round up 20.7 to the nearest whole integer, you get to 21. I know that a lot of people like to use SMAs. I myself like to use EMAs. I like to use EMAs because of how they're constructed and weighted. 
you have a five period SMA, for example, an SMA equal weights each of the five periods. So what happened yesterday counts just as much in the calculation as what happened the day before, which counts just as much as what happened the day before that, et cetera, et cetera. With EMAs, there's a time decay function built in where near-term price action counts more in the calculation of the moving average than older price action. What happened yesterday matters a lot more than what happened five days ago. And I think that makes a lot of sense because when we talk about what's happening in the market on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week basis, investors are constantly adjusting their perspective, constantly taking in new information and reviewing their strategy, reviewing their investment thesis, reviewing their trading prognosis for what could happen in the near term. And when we have a Federal Reserve meeting every few weeks, when we have U.S. economic data coming out every few days, those estimations of how the economy is going to perform, how corporate earnings will evolve, those in fact need to be reflected because we could get a non-farm payrolls report, we could get a U.S. GDP report, we could get a Federal Reserve rate decision like we have one due tomorrow that fundamentally alters our perspective on how we should proceed. And when we use an SMA, unfortunately, it doesn't allow for that new information to be digested and reflected in a timely basis, at least from my perspective. So I like to use EMAs over SMAs. But the simple gist here is, we use shorter term moving averages to compare them to longer term moving averages. When the shorter term moving average moves above a longer term moving average, that's generally seen as a buy signal. When a short term moving average moves below a longer term moving average, that's viewed as a sell signal. So in our first example for our shorter term set of moving averages, if the five were to cross above the 21, that means we have growing bullish momentum. And I would be looking for long opportunities in that case. When the five crosses below the 21, means we have bearish momentum gathering pace, we'd be looking for selling opportunities. The other set of moving averages that I like to use would be the 21, the 55, and the 200. Now, again, the 55 is another Fibonacci, uh, Fibonacci number. The 200 is a number that everyone looks at. You hear people talk about this in the news all the time. If you turn on CNBC or Bloomberg or Yahoo Finance or Cheddar, you'll hear people saying, so-and-so stock above its 200-day moving average. Or like we've heard over the last several days, uh, the S&P 500 has fallen below its 200-day moving average. This may not be a number of significance, right? It's not, you know, for example, uh, a Fibonacci number. It's not the number of trading days in the average quarter. It's not the number of trading days in the average year even. But it is one of those psychological numbers because it is a nice, big, fat, round number that people look to. And people look to those round numbers. In fact, the most popular moving averages that you'll hear, hear about tend to be the 10, the 20, the 50, the 100, the 200. Regardless of what moving average number you're using as your input for calculating trend, the simple premise remains. When long-term average uh, is undercut by the short-term average, or how should I say this? When the short-term moving average moves above the long-term average, it's generally seen as a condition for looking for buy entries. When the short-term moving average drops below the long-term moving average, it's looking for selling opportunities. That is the basic heuristic. We don't need to overcomplicate it. You know, the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid. For me, very easy. Short above long, that means we're looking for buys. Short below long, we're looking for sells. Again, I prefer the EMA. The EMA calculates a calculation attributes a higher weighting to recent price moves compared to the SMA, which only takes a general average over a specified time period. I think the EMA is better suited when we're trying to reflect new information as it comes to the market. And I think that with a day like tomorrow coming up with this Federal Reserve meeting, uh, EMAs will be a lot more useful in our toolkit than SMAs, which will still be more heavily weighting or equal weighting price action that was before the Fed. I also like to use Fibonacci retracements in the course of my trading. And I say that because uh, it's important to be able to find levels of support and resistance. And there are a number of ways to do so, but one of the mechanisms that I find interesting, appealing, intriguing, effective would be using Fibonacci retracements. 
And of course, like I said before, there are a, a number of ways, a plethora of ways to find support and resistance. Some are very simple using pivots. Others can be ornate and complicated. This Fibonacci sequence to me uh, is something that's interesting because it's reflected in nature, right? We can find this in the world around us. We can find this in architecture or even nature, you know, in the spirals of a pine cone or uh, uh, certain seashells. We can see this in even breeding cycles of certain animals in the wild, like rabbits. Fibonacci retracements numbers are not just here on Earth, but when we measure the spirals of galaxies, we can see that the relationship between uh, different branches are all hewing to <clears throat> the Fibonacci retracement levels. So Fibonacci sequences, they occur in nature. They're something that traders look to to find support and resistance in markets. They make a lot of sense, almost naturally, right? The sequence follows very simply, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, et cetera, et cetera. Each next number in the sequence can be found by adding the previous two numbers. And this truly goes on for infinity. There is an interesting observation about the sequence of these mathematical relationships within. Each number effectively is 1.618 times the prior number's value. And this is called phi the golden ratio. For traders, the importance of dealing with these Fibonaccis uh, is about the relationship within the sequence itself. Each number in the sequence after the initial portion is 61.8% of the next number's value. So 34 divided by 55 is 0.618. 55 divided by 89 is 0 0.618. 89 divided by 144 is, you guessed it, 0 0.618. If we were to take each number in the sequence divided by two numbers later, we're getting 0.382. So 34 divided by 89 is 0.382. 55 divided by 144 is 0.382. These are really the two important Fibonacci retracements that you want to look for when determining whether or not a market has reached a turning point or not. There are also a few other Fibonacci numbers that you can take a look at. You know, the 23.6 is not two or one, but three spaces. So if we take 34 divided by 144, we get to 23.6. If we take 55 divided by 233, we get to 23.6. The numbers that make the Fibonacci sequence constitute the retracement levels that we add to our charts. This may seem complicated, but I'm going to show charts in a little bit to substantiate this point of view here. Uh, I do want to summarize though quickly. Fibonacci retracement levels can be utilized as any other potential support or resistance mechanism. The mere potential until it begins to come into play at which point it offers the opportunity for a trader to implement an if-then statement is just that, it's potential. If support or resistance holds, then we are given substantive evidence in front of us that there is meaning behind this number. If we see that the Fibonacci retracement level is busted, then it means our start and end point for analysis is out of line with what the broader market is assuming at any given point in time. So if you draw a Fibonacci retracement and you see a market collapse right through its 23.6 Fibonacci level or its 61.8% Fibonacci level, it may mean that the start and end point for your analysis for determining the support and resistance levels is wrong. It almost helps to go back and backfit. Find a start and end point where the market seems to adhere to those Fibonacci retracements. Because that's the point of view, that's the look back period, that's the economic regime or trading perspective that the market's adhering to at that point in time. We're going to talk about these on charts for the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, and the Russell very shortly. But the point here is that you need to be subjective in your analysis. There's no hard and true fast rule for finding your start and entry points, your beginning and end dates for your Fibonacci levels. You may want to look to longer term moves from the highs and lows of significant trends. You may want to look over the course of a week, 
seeing what the weekly high-low is or the monthly high-low is or the yearly high-low is when drawing your Fibonacci retracements. But the point is that when we want to apply these to our charts, we're looking for levels where the market responds because then that may be indicative of how it could behave in the future. The third layer here comes down to two different momentum indicators. I like to use MACD, the Moving Average Convergence Divergence, and Slow Stochastics. Like I said before, I'm not a range trader, so I don't look at something like RSI. RSI is good if you are a range trader because it shows relative strength within a confined period of spaces. RSI is not a good indicator to use if you are looking at trends or breakouts. Because if you're looking at a breakout opportunity, let's say higher, RSI is going to stay elevated. And even though the market is telling you, yes, we're overbought here, that doesn't necessarily mean it's time to sell. The same thing in trending markets. When markets trend, RSI can stay overbought. But that's actually a good thing when we talk about our momentum indicators. Indications that a market is overbought or oversold is an indication of strong directional momentum. Well, first here, before we go into those charts, I do want to just give the high-level academic explanation of these two indicators. Uh, MACD is a technical indicator which measures the relationship between moving averages. And given our discussion on moving averages earlier, I think this is a nice addendum to our analytical tool set. We have two lines, a blue line and a red line, which is our signal line, uh, and a histogram. And it shows the difference between the MACD and the signal line. The MACD line itself is the difference between two exponentially leveled moving averages, usually the 12 and 26 periods as standard when you put this indicator on your chart. The signal line is generally a nine period EMA of the MACD itself. And these MACD lines waver in and around a zero line, which is known as a signal line. So when MACD is rising and it crosses above its zero line or signal line, that's typically seen as a sign that the market is moved into a state of bullish momentum and is typically seen as a buying opportunity. When the MACD lines fall below the zero or signal line, that's an indication that momentum has turned lower, that bearish opportunities are given a green light. The higher that we go above our signal line, the stronger our bullish momentum. The lower we go below our signal line, the stronger our bearish momentum. Fairly simple, right? Stochastics are the other thing I like looking at. This is another momentum indicator. I use these two in concert, stochastics and MACD, because they give slightly different perspectives on momentum. We could go through periods where the two diverge, but when they are both moving in the same direction in concert, that gives us the strongest view for momentum. It gives us the most confidence in our analysis of the market of which way trade should be taken. If both stochastics and MACD are rising at the same time, it's a very strong indication that we should be looking for bullish trade setups. If they're both falling at the same time, it's a very strong indication, in my opinion, that we should be looking at bearish trade setups. Again, how this is constructed, there's a faster line and a slower line. The faster line on our chart, typically a blue line when you add it to your chart, is known as the K line. And the slower moving average is the D line. Because this is an oscillator, it tends to move between 80 and 20. When we get above 80, it means that the market is overbought and is a strong state of bullish momentum. When we're below 20, it means the market's oversold and we're in a strong state of bearish momentum. So we're going to combine all these things now to take a look at what's happening with three major indices, the S&P 500, the Russell, and the NASDAQ. And I point to these three things because they give us three unique views. <clears throat> of different types of stocks or themes in the market. The S&P 500 is a good worldview into the state of the broader economy, right? The Russell 2000 is more focused on small caps, and so it's more domestically focused, whereas the S&P 500 has a large number of constituents that generate corporate earnings from abroad. So when we talk about how the US economy and all of its companies are performing, the S&P 500 talks about things that are generally happening perhaps outside of the United States as well. But the Russell 2000, well, it's talking about more of a US stock market that's focused on domestic earning potential because smaller companies only tend to operate within the United States. 
it's rare that you'll find uh, a smaller company have operations in Europe, in Asia, in South America, in Africa, right? You know, Microsoft is fundamentally different than, you know, perhaps an Ace Hardware, for example. Um, Ace Hardware has a number of locations around the continent in the United States, but not many significant operations abroad. Whereas a Microsoft sells its software, scales on a global basis in Canada, in Europe, in Germany, right? Uh, in South Africa, in Indonesia, in China even. It has its foot in a number of different markets. So for the S&P 500, this is a good view of everything. The Russell is more of small cap domestic focused. And then the NASDAQ, of course, is technology focused. It is the growth index. Technology is forward looking. We're talking about those castles in the sky, the hopes and dreams of tomorrow. How can the future be better? than it is today. Those companies that are innovating, those companies that are trying to achieve very high rates of growth. Not necessarily brick and mortar companies, more software, more digital. And so when we talk about risk, where do investors put their money when they're looking for risk? Well, they're putting it into companies with high growth opportunities that may have a technology that changes the way the world operates. And that's where the NASDAQ comes into play. But over the last few weeks, all three of these indices have taken a bit of a beating. The S&P 500 here, this was clipped today, just about 30 minutes before we started presenting, it's trading at 43.39. We've come down quite a little bit, and for the first time since early May 2020, we are back below our 200-day moving average. When we take a look at where we are in terms of Fibonacci levels, We've fallen quite a bit, but we have not yet achieved the 23.6 retracement of the 2020 low to 2022 high move. So there are a few things in play here right now. When we consider the fact that the market necessarily hasn't returned back to a key Fibonacci level yet, although it got close yesterday, and we consider the fact that we're still below the 200-day moving average, it may behoove us to think that there could be more downside ahead. And sure enough, when we take a look at our momentum indicators, MACD continuing to fall through its signal line and stochastics are holding an overbought territory. The market is the most over, excuse me, oversold territory. The market is the most oversold per stochastics that we've seen since March of 2020, the depths of the pandemic. When we put all these three things together, we have somewhat of a concerning view right now. We're below our longer term moving average. We see that momentum is turning to the downside. We have not yet reached the lows that would come into play near the 23.6 Fibonacci retracement. From this perspective, until we find some evidence that it's a good idea, technically speaking, to trade higher, to look for buying opportunities, it may mean that we're looking for selling opportunities. It may mean that we're looking for opportunities to short the market. When momentum is sparing the way that it is right now, with price below its longer term moving averages, with Fibonacci levels that are critical to the pandemic trend not having yet been reached, it warrants a high degree of caution if you're trading from the long side. This, of course, is a similar view that's reflected right now in the Russell. The Russell, the small cap focused US indice, has been struggling here too. And when we take a look at our moving averages, we can see that price action is still struggling. The three moving averages that I have on this chart, just like for the S&P 500, the 21, the 55, and the 200, we're beginning to see that they're all falling into a bearish pattern. The 21 is below the 55. The 55 is about to cross below the 200, and current prices are well below all three moving averages. But somewhat reflective of the fact that this market has proved already weaker than the S&P 500, that Concerns about U.S. growth have been cropping up in recent weeks in part because of the Omicron variant, and GDP expectations have fallen from near 10% at the start of November to 5% ahead of this Thursday's GDP release, according to the Atlanta Fed GDP Now growth tracker for the fourth quarter. We can see that the Russell has already undercut its 23.6 Fibonacci retracement. It has already breached a level that, relatively speaking, the S&P 500 has not. When we take a look at our momentum indicators, we get a very similar story to the S&P 500. 
MACD is falling at its most pre precipitous pace since the depths of the coronavirus pandemic. Slow stochastics are deeply oversold, the most oversold that they've been since late February 2020. And when we combine all these three things together, we have a rather dire outlook. Even the 200 day moving average, the slope of the moving average is starting to turn negative. The slope of the moving averages matter a lot because it gives us a view of how the market is positioned on a longer term basis, how we are trading relative to say 200 days ago. And so when the slope of the 200 day turns lower, it brings in some concern. It makes us question whether or not buying opportunities are the right perspective. Should it be buying dips or selling rallies? Well, from this point of view right now, it may be the case that yes, there are long opportunities in the short term. And I mean that on perhaps an intraday basis, depending upon trade setups, but the broader direction of this market is to the downside. We've seen the 23.6 Fibonacci retracement come into support at the end of 2022. But once broken earlier this month, it has now become a firm resistance level. We can see actually throughout 2021, in hindsight, that the 23.6 was very key support over the course of the year. One, two, three, four, five different touches of that 23.6 Fibonacci retracement. And so from my perspective right now, providing opportunities to look for sales, to look to go short, against this backdrop may be the prudent method of operating. For the NASDAQ, it's even worse. The NASDAQ has really fallen on hard times here recently. The NASDAQ is underperforming the other major indices thus far this year. To think that we were trading closer to 16,500 coming into 2022, we're now trading at 14,127 when this chart was clipped again, about 30 minutes before the presentation began. Like for the Russell, like for the S&P 500, we are deep below our 200-day moving average. We have not been this far below our 200-day moving average since the depths of the pandemic. And you can sense the theme here. There is pain, there is angst, there is concern in these markets right now. Very much like the Russell, we've already broken back below the 23.6 Fibonacci retracement, a level which came in as support, in hindsight, twice over the course of 2021. And when we add our momentum indicators in here, and let's add those momentum indicators in here, we can see that MACD and stochastics are right back at the lows that they were in the pandemic in March 2020. It's difficult to suggest right now that today is the time to looking to be buy, buying this market. There may be some short-term tackle opportunities, but if we have opportunities to sell rallies, that may be our best course of action. The market has taken on a more bearish tone, plain and simple. With the Federal Reserve meeting tomorrow, it's possible that we get a relief rally higher. I think a lot of what's been happening over these last few weeks in markets has been reflective of the fact that people feel concerned that the Fed will come in and tell us that we are looking at a very aggressive pace of tightening. I happen to have a different perspective I don't think the Fed is going to tell us they're going to raise rates by 50 basis points in March. I don't think the Fed is going to start its quantitative tightening program by the end of this year, in part because I think inflation is still transitory. I know that's unpopular, but credit growth globally has slowed dramatically in recent months. Central banks are pulling back from their stimulus. Fiscal authorities are no longer stimulating. There's no more COVID checks being sent out to people. And if we take a look at the relationship between global stimulus efforts and credit expansion relative to inflation, it means that we could be back below 3% or so by September or October. And if headline inflation is falling that rapidly over the course of this year, why would the Fed want to intentionally, say, slow down growth or boost unemployment? They're not going to do so. So I do think when we take a look at tomorrow's event, if the Fed comes out and says, yes, you know, there are concerns and inflation is very high and uh, that's something that we're worried about right now, but they don't tell us that we're going to get quantitative tightening, that they don't tell us that we're going to see five or six rate hikes this year, which is what some people 
at certain banks are suggesting right now. Perhaps the CEO of one of the big four banks himself came out last week and said he could see six or seven rate hikes in 2022. Then maybe the market does have a relief rally. But given the posture of markets right now, it would be a rally, in my opinion, that we would look to sell. And I think that's going to be the prudent course of action until we find some stability in our charts, until we see these 23.6% retracements retaken, until we see prices return back above that 200-day moving average, until we see our momentum indicators rise back out of oversold territory and begin to move through their signal line. Otherwise, right now in the very short term, this is the time to be cautious. If you are trading from the long side, you need to be very prudent with your risk management. You need to take very uh, a strict risk controls and risk efforts to mitigate potential losses. You may need to be trading in smaller size. Uh, generally speaking, when we're in this type of market right now, I don't like to take significant long positions. I know it may be appealing to be a hero and say, I'm going to call the low. I'm going to go in and size here. I'm going to dollar cost average into longer term positions. I'm going to try to bottom tick this thing. That tends to be a profitable strategy, and it can be a very profitable strategy when we are in the throes of an uptrend, when we have MACD trending higher and holding above its signal line and prices well above their 200-day moving average and stochastics holding out in overbought territory. But in the market that we're in right now, when we're looking at a market where the technicals have broken down so dramatically so quickly, it may be beneficial longer term to be a little bit more cautious. Keep your powder dry. You're taking long opportunities. Make sure they're small. Make sure your risk is contained. If there are opportunities to sell rallies as things stand right now here today at 1.50 p.m. Eastern on Tuesday, January 25th, the perspective would be looking to sell rallies and potential short opportunities in the major indices. And until the technicals turn, there's really nothing else I have to say about this. Now, once the technicals turn, however, the fundamentals still look pretty strong. Our earnings yield is going up. Our PE ratios are coming down. The froth in the market is disappearing. And ultimately speaking, 2022, at least according to earnings estimates, looks like it will still be a very strong year, at least the first half of the year. But right now, we don't have enough confidence in our charts to suggest that being a rampant bull, being a hodler, as they would say in the crypto parlance, having diamond hands, as they say in the Wall Street bets parlance, is the right modus operandi. It's a fundamentally different market than it was in 2020 and 2021. We don't have unending Fed stimulus. We don't have fiscal authorities pumping the markets full of stimulus checks like we did for the much the last the past two years. And I think that's really what's caught a lot of people by surprise. So if you were new to this market, I would suggest going back and looking at how markets behaved in 2015 and again in 2018, periods when the Fed was winding down its QE program, when the Fed was raising interest rates, when we did not have fiscal stimulus. Those periods of time are more comparable to than what we've seen in the last two years. History doesn't necessarily repeat, but it often rhymes as Mark Twain once said. We don't need to be driving blind into this new environment where all of a sudden, what seemed to be an easy market at the end of December is now once again, one that's very difficult. We can use history to guide our decision-making, to inform us of what may transpire in the future. And ultimately, that's what technical analysis is. It's the study of price action. It's the study of human psychology, how people behave during different fundamental environments, but the fundamental environment has shifted. And so caution is warranted. With that said, here at Daily FX, we talk about these things in more on a day-to-day -day basis. We produce these fundamental and technical articles as well as quantitative studies to talk about the implications for broader markets. Each week we hold several live webinars sharing our opinions on what may transpire different technical levels and review of key economic events that are coming up. Uh, Monday, for example, we did our Markets Week Ahead. That's every Monday morning at 9.30 Eastern, 14.30 GMT. Tomorrow, we'll be doing live coverage of the Federal Reserve meeting. 
1.45 p.m. Eastern start time. And you can find that on dailyfx.com itself. Each week we publish forecasts for the major currencies and asset classes, oil, gold, even crypto. You can find us across a variety of news channels, Daily FX Real Time News Feed, Stock Twitch and Twitter, and YouTube. And likewise, our main goal here, our thrust of what we're trying to do is help retail traders, people like yourselves, become more informed decision makers in the market. Ultimately, when you succeed, we succeed. We want to make sure that you have the tools in your toolkit to be successful over the long term, that this isn't just a passing fad, that this helps pave the path for you towards financial security and financial success, however you define that, whatever that may be. It could simply be having enough money to save up for a vacation. It could be something like looking to be able to put a down payment on a new home or build your retirement account or send your kid off to college. We want to arm you with the tools and the education and the knowledge so that you can navigate these mar markets, how easy or difficult they may be for you, successfully. So feel free to reach out. Again, my Twitter handle, Daily FX Real Time Newsfeed, Stock Twits, at CVecuFX. You can always email me, CVecu at dailyfx.com. Be happy to answer your questions and put you in touch with the right materials you need to build out your trading toolkit.